Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for joining us for our third press conference here in the media programme, the Global Agenda Council Summit 2014. This one is to mark the launch of our Global Leadership Index, which um, is a, a new endeavour by the councils. It's the first time we've attempted to do this. But basically, it's to try to cast a light on what state we are in in terms of global leadership. And we're looking at it from a variety of different ways, whether it's... Um, from a regional lens, through a gender lens, through an age lens, or through particular sectors of society. So, um, quite, a, quite a fascinating finding. You would have, um, if you were eagle-eyed, noticed it was uh, published on Friday in our Outlook on the Global Agenda, so you can read all about it here. But we're just going to try to offer you some more context and some more insight. So, uh, I will announce the panel, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A session. On my um, immediate left here, we have Martina Larkin, my colleague, from the World Economic Forum. Martina is the Senior Director and Head of the Network of Global Agenda Councils here. Next to Martina is Carl Bildt, former Prime Minister of Sweden and a member of the Global Agenda Council on Europe. Then we have Yaza Jara. Um, those of you who were with us for the Future of Government briefing a few minutes earlier will have, uh, will re remember Yaza is a member of the Future of Government Council and Senior Partner at Bain here in the UAE. We hope to be joined by Anne-Marie Slaughter, President and Chief Executive Officer of the New America Foundation in the USA today. I'm going to start by asking Martina to give us a brief overview of what she believes are the, you know, the, uh, the, the salient points among the trends that we uncovered in the Global Leadership Index. Thanks, Ali. What we uh, discovered through our findings of over 1,700 experts is really a fundamental lack of confidence in global leadership. 86% of our respondents agree that there is a global leadership crisis in the world today. And of course, this poses a serious challenge to the prospects of tackling some of the challenges that we've been discussing yesterday, the day before, and tomorrow in, in Dubai here, but also generally uh, as we look to, to the global trends that are in the outlook more generally. What is interesting also is that there's a ma massive shakeup of traditional values. Um, as confidence in religious leaders is, is the lowest in all of our stakeholder groups. And international organizations are doing very well. They're, they're ranked number one, followed very closely by business leaders. And governments are second lowest, so governments are not doing that well, um, uh, as well as media leaders <laughs> for this particular crowd. Um, maybe interesting to, to note. In terms of the skills that people are looking towards, it's really uh, unanimous accord, uh, across gender and, and generations in the top list, but then it starts differentiating as of the top three or so. On top of the list is, is a global perspective, need to collaborate and better communication. These are really the three skills that were highlighted that, that our respondents uh, ask from, from global leaders. And uh, then there's some differences across the, the generations and gender, but we can go into these maybe a bit later and, and I'll leave others to, to give their perspectives as well. Thanks, Martina. Carl, we're not lumping all the, all the blame on, on yourself as a former Prime Minister um, of Sweden. Now he's former. Uh, uh, it's because uh, of that. But because please feel, that. feel <laughs> liberated to, to comment on the fact that the you know, government is the uh, comes seventh out of eight stakeholder groups in this, in this index and perhaps offer you some thoughts on what government could do to restore trust and, and faith in leadership. I think what, what you see in these figures is a reflection of the fact that political leaders throughout the Western world, really, or throughout the world, have been or are overwhelmed by the magnitude of the challenges that they are facing. I'm not going to say that everything was simple and easy before. That was not the case. It was a complex world there as well, but it's becoming increasingly complex and increasingly challenging. There are no easy answers available. We have, obviously, since 2008, a very different and more challenging economic environment, be that in Europe or be that globally. We have uh, environmental challenges with climate change that is putting no new pressures both on our economic and political systems. We have lately health challenges in terms of Ebola. And we suddenly have also a geopolitical situation that is more demanding. Either if we speak about Russian aggression in Ukraine or we speak about the ISIL threat in the Middle East or we speak about the emergence of a far more assertive, somewhat nationalist China with the implications that is having for East Asian security. So quite a number of developments. And what is happening is, of course, since there are no easy 
obvious answers. Um, and sometimes public expect the political leadership to deliver the easy answers and political leadership aren't. That is reflected in, I think, the lower level of confidence in political leadership. The way to overcome this is, of course, to find the answers. Um, that's somewhat easier said than done, has to be said. But demands for, demand for political leadership is very high. People want political leadership. At a t period of uncertainty, they're looking for leadership. Uh, so the demand is there. And then it's a question of delivering that particular leadership. And that requires, of course, uh, grasping the magnitude of the challenges and trying to deliver the answers. And as we are in this period of mounting challenges, the multitude of mounting challenges, uh, that is a somewhat demanding task for political leaders. I think that's the explanation for the figures that you see coming out of this particular survey. Uh, you also see it in other, I noticed that confidence in religious leaders was down. Uh, well, in certain areas, I mean, religious leaders, if I go to Europe, um, in modern times, have been supposed to deliver harmony. I mean, go back to the Thirty Years' War, they were not really delivering harmony, they were delivering strife. Um, and now we see in other parts of the world, notably this part of the world, there's a perception that religious leaders are delivering more strife than harmony. And that is also reflected, I think, in the declining confidence in religious leaders in different parts of the world. Thank you, Carl. Yes, sir. as a, um, a local businessman and uh, somebody who's based here in the region, perhaps you, you could offer some insights into uh, the leadership index. Business, of course, ranking number two, maybe it's easier to be a business leader. Perhaps business leaders are doing something right. What are your thoughts? Well, it's, 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 it's definitely easier. And, and, and less overwhelming, but not, 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 uh, not something to be taken for granted. I think when I looked at the results initially, um, something that came to mind that if you look at the challenges, income inequality, jobless growth, uh, issues like weakening democracy, pollution, most of that list is failures of leadership. Failures of global leadership, failures of organizational leadership. So the leadership isn't just an issue we're facing in the future, it's also one of the root causes probably of a lot of these problems. And I reflected more and more about, you know, what is business doing right? Is business doing anything right? Are the NGOs doing anything right? Or is it just a matter that the others are much worse? And I think there's something about expectations and delivery. The level of expectations globally is increasing from all parts of the society, business, governments, NGOs. These expectations are now fueled by a rise of social media and a spread of technology whereby we're sharing and we're comparing you know, 15 years ago, you couldn't compare what's happening in your country to many other countries as easily. You couldn't voice your opinion. So the governments are not maybe getting worse, but their, you know, their weaknesses are being much more exposed and getting much more challenged. And um, so that's something that led to that. And then we look at the businesses and the NGOs. They are on the front line. They say we're going to do one thing, and by and large, they deliver it. NGOs don't have political interests, majority of them to play with, they're trying to deliver services on the front line. Businesses are delivering their promises and trying to grow and because they have a very single focus. They focus on profits, they set the rules of the game. Um, and to be honest, the, uh, the, uh, if we think more and more about the governments and we think are they inherently untrustworthy, well they are, they are a result at the moment of the rules of the game that they have to play with. We have hardwired ourselves into a system of government and governance that's probably not suitable for today's challenges. So they're also bound when they're overwhelmed and also bound by the international governance issues. So we see an age of broken promises from pollution, if you're interested in the environment, to local delivery of health services. We see an age of broken promises which is affecting the trust in government and the confidence. Whereas in the businesses, it's a little bit more easier to deliver on what you say I want to do. Thank you. Let's see a uh, show of hands, see if there are any questions. Gentleman there on the third row, please. Could you uh, remind us your name, please, sir, and where you're from? Yeah, Sudesh from Gulf News. Uh, my question is to Mr. Uh, the former Prime Minister of Sweden. Um, uh, don't you think that we should rise above uh, the regional alliances like the ASEAN or SARC or G20 because we stay in a more globalized world, uh, so globalized that someone uh, sneezes in Europe, we catch cold here. I, I, I didn't get it quite because of the acoustics was... 
Sorry, uh, my question is that don't you think that we should rise above and and have more like a participative uh, participative alliance all across the world? Uh, you know, rise above, say G20 or G8, whatever, or well, ASEAN. I I think we would all love to see that. Um, uh, clearly, we have a crisis of global governance when it comes to X numbers of these particular issues. That the structures of global governance that we have are insufficient or in crisis. And that has to do also with sort of both the mounting economic challenges but also the rising geopolitical tensions that are there. And that makes it more difficult to achieve what you aim at and what we would desire, more of cooperation to, uh, to address these particular challenges. I mean, we have diplomacy is a difficult issue. Uh, we have sort of major challenges. We've had... Uh, a UN-sponsored effort, Arab League to a certain extent, to settle the conflict in Syria. That has not been a big success, to put it in the mildest possible forms. We have an ongoing discussion which is extremely important in Muscat at the moment, between EU, US and others in Iran on the nuclear file. Uh, we have ongoing talks in Beijing as we speak, uh, between China and Japan in order to try to resolve some of the acute differences there, as well as some of the economic issues in the East Pacific. Uh, but as we are in this period of mounting challenges, there is also mounting tensions, and that makes it more difficult to achieve what uh, I absolutely agree with you. We, we should try to achieve. And one more question to Larkin: uh, uh, Don't, as in looking at the event, uh, don't you think that media should, as in media, ideally should be uh, where where the NGOs are, because uh, uh, media raises the voice of the people, and uh, and and build a trust factor with, with, with the larger masses. What was the, sorry, what was the first part of the question? Don't you media think that, uh, that media should be uh, at the place where NGOs, uh, NGOs well, yeah. are in terms of I mean, of ideally everyone should be on the top level. Yes, they, they definitely do have an important role to play and they should play a much bigger role and, and be much more of a trusted partner in, in sort of addressing some of these issues. And clearly they're not, so I think there's a big gap between what is expected and what people think is being delivered and what is truly delivered. Um, but I also wanted to make a point on, on your previous question about global governance. Clearly, the majority, large majority of our respondents also felt that global governance is a very important uh, concept. Uh, nearly 90% of them think it's, it's a very important concept, but it's extremely poorly implemented. And when we look at the next 12 to 18 months, none of them actually thought that global governance can be used to solve the challenges that we're facing and the majority of the regions uh, opt for na regionals, regional or national governance. So in the Middle East, in Europe, a lot of them look towards regional governance, which we, we see a lot of regional alliances now going up, growing up, but also national uh, you know, governments taking much more ownership over how to govern things. Even China has, has you know, really uh, taken leadership in showing the, the world what can be done on some of these global challenges. So. I think it's an interesting debate, but clearly not yet fully explored at all. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Okay, lady in the third row. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Maria Gonzalez from uh, Comsmia. Um, Mr. Gerard, you talk about social media, saying that it brings uh, some perspective um, and some connectivity between countries as it helps to... Uh, communicate different citizens and uh, realize in which um, um, system they're, they're working on. Do you, I, I really don't know if you um, comment that as a positive thing or as a negative thing. And uh, I would like to know how um, governments should improve connectivity in order to um, give, this, um, give this way to um, well, communicate with the world, saying what is going on in these countries, uh, what is the role of social media for governments, and what, how governments should take the voice of social media, the voice of citizens uh, that are talking through the social media. Of course, not everyone is in social media, but still, it's an important voice that maybe um, government should take care of. And uh, then, a second question I would like to know of you uh, here in this Global Agenda Summit, you will have, um, you will. Um, give some guidelines to this, um, for example, religious organizations or governments, of course, or um, news and media guidelines to say what they have to improve and how they should improve. 
Sounds like an interesting future challenge for the, for the network. So maybe, Mr. Bilt, you could ask the first question. Can social media be deployed more effectively to improve trust in leadership? And Martina, perhaps uh, you could offer some thoughts on um, whether we can take this, these findings and, and how will we use them? Social media is exploding all over the world, no question about that. And that means that sort of one of the sort of industries, if you use that phrase, in the world that is under greatest pressure and greatest pressure of transformation is the entire media business. I mean, there's not a newspaper, there's not a media house in the world that is not under significant pressure and are complaining, by the way. But at the same time, there are new sources of information and new channels. And, and I, I think it's going to be even more dramatic as we look ahead. Because what is happening now is that we move over to, you already have it to some extent, of course, the face of the net revolution which goes mobile. I mean, my favorite statistics is that within five years, we'll have 65% of the population of the world covered by four or 5G networks, that is mobile broadband. And that means that in those 65% of the population of the world, nearly every person under 15 years of age, or 20 years of age, let's say that, will have some sort of more or less sophisticated smartphone. I mean, cheaper smartphones are coming out of the Chinese production that will make it possible for very many more people to have it. And social media will be on all of these platforms, which means that traditional media will have to sort of change and politics will have to change uh, because the interaction between sort of the electorate and, and the governments will to a large extent be through social media. New channels opening up for political leaders to communicate and communicate two ways, both getting their message across and listening to the voice of the people and getting information from all over the world. So, so it is a true revolution that is coming with social media. And I think we are only in the beginning of it and, and uh, we'll fully understand the magnitude of it perhaps in a couple of years. Martina. Um, so on, on what we're doing here with the forum and, and, and the councils, First, uh, it's obviously important to raise it and, and raise awareness of, of the fact and, and, and make sure that we you know, have it on, on our global agenda as well. We obviously have representatives from all of these stakeholder groups here in Dubai, but also in our larger network within the forum. So clearly we're working with them already. And I think that the, the fact that they're here, that they're committing three days or <laughs> um, two years essentially to the councils is already a big step and shows leadership that they do want to address these issues. Um, but we, you know, this is just a start and we're going to use those councils and members of the councils to really look at some of these challenges and also make recommendations how to address them and the forum is committed to bring those recommendations forward to Davos and to the regional events in spring to really make sure that they're not just remaining within that network but really are more spread and applied across the world and across our different stakeholder groups and communities. And just to offer a bit of context that a lot of the brainstorming and thought leadership that's generated here really is taken forward and used in Davos and developed in Davos as well as elsewhere and this really is the beginning of a road to Davos in, in terms of a, of a roadmap of great ideas that, that get incubated throughout the course of the next year. The, the Global Agenda Councils do not just meet once a year, they have regular um, phone calls and, and conference calls and, and, and developing ideas and different projects at different streams throughout the year. Thank you very much uh, indeed to you for joining us and thank you indeed to my panel for, for being here and explaining more about this index and uh, I wish you all a very good summit. Thank you. Thanks very much.